Welcome to Using Chemical Biology for Epigenetics Research and Drug Discovery. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Our three speakers today, each intimately familiar with epigenetics research and drug discovery, will review epigenetic regulatory mechanisms and methodologies available for their characterization. In the process, they will explain how histone methylation biological systems can be manipulated and studied in cell-based assays, how a, bi a chemical biology strategy used in phenotypic screen can reveal pathway selective regulators, and how systematically designed chemical probe libraries can serve as drug discovery tools when combined with phenotypic screening. Before this webinar gets underway, though, I want to introduce our speakers and encourage you to stay tuned for the live Q&A session that will follow the presentations. Our speakers will answer as many of your questions as time allows. Our first speaker is Michelle Palmer, Director of Discovery and Preclinical Research at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Our other two presenters, Yan Liu and Wailing Tiger B, are scientists in molecular discovery research at GlaxoSmithKline. All of our presenters have a lot of material to cover today, so we're going to jump right in. Michelle, let's get started. Thanks, Pamela. Central to um, our uh, mission at the Broad um, is uh, the translation of our findings in human genetics to novel therapeutic strategies to treat those, those human diseases. And uh, a recent review from colleagues at the Broad laid out an argument for improving the success rate in drug discovery. It's our belief that nature shows us that a particular protein target or target activity when modified can be efficacious or um, non-toxic. And there's three different ways in which um, nature uh, modulates those targets. One is um, human mutations that can increase or decrease the function of a gene through gain of function or loss of function alleles. Uh, a second is the um, observations uh, obtained through drugs that can pharmacologically increase or decrease um, the, the target function. And then um, additionally, naturally occurring conditions that may uh, increase or, or decrease the amount of that target. And these types of observations um, then can be used to estimate the probable efficacy or toxicity of a drug that is targeting those proteins. Um, and so you're actually doing the experiment in humans in that sense. Um, so this is a, 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 a principle that we apply to in selecting targets um, for our therapeutic projects. Now, the field of epigenetics is a field where there's a, a number of very exciting and uh, relevant um, uh, drug discovery targets, and there is a variety of enzymes that are involved in, in modifying the, the, the structure of, of chromatin. Um, there's over 200 enzymes that have been identified, and their function and role is, is, is growing. They um, cover um, numerous post-translational modifications, acetylation, uh, phosphorylation um, and methylation being some of the key um, regulatory elements there. And uh, examples of, of the, the, the types of um, uh, enzymes involved in this process are the HDACs or um, in the case of um, methyltransferases, um, uh, histomethyltransferases, um, uh, EZH2 and, and DOT1L. There's um, a growing body of um, uh, very useful information, both um, emerging from the academic and uh, pharmaceutical um, areas uh, through publications. And one um, site that's of uh, extreme uh, value is a, um, a, a large public-private consortium, um, the Structural Genomic Consortium, and uh, they provide a wealth of information both about the function and role of, of uh, epigenetic targets as well as uh, known drugs or um, pro-molecules that, that can selectively act against those, those targets. And um, uh, in this slide, it's just a, a snapshot of the website uh, called ChromoHub that is a, a link into this, this, this wealth of information. On the next slide, um, it's a schematic representation of uh, the function of uh, one of these uh, important target classes um, uh, that, that represents the um, uh, acetylation mechanism that uh, is involved in modulating gene transcription as well as acting as a, a scaffolding function to recruit uh, the regulatory complexes to the, um, that particular region of, of, of the genome. And um, 
the um, histone uh, acetylase transfer uh, enzymes are um, adding acetylation uh, marks to, to the um, histone tails. And uh, what this um, actually does is, is transcriptionally activate a given region of, of, uh, of that gene for um, uh, transcription. Um, conversely, the, um, uh, the, the HDACs remove those acetylation marks and, and thus um, repressing uh, transcription. So it's a highly regulated process. The role of HDACs in human disease um, is, is um, as I said earlier, is, is growing. And um, in particular, the HDACs, which were once thought to be um, somewhat generic in their role, there's an emerging um, body of evidence that now is showing that individual isoforms have very specific roles in, in disease and, and, and regulation, um, ranging from uh, various cancers um, to um, uh, other types of um, human disease states like cardiovascular disease. Uh, inflammation, and um, a particular uh, area of interest of ours is in, in schizophrenia and uh, psychiatric disorders. The um, HDAC family of enzymes um, are actually organized into four different classes, um, which are based on sequence homology and, and mechanism. And um, uh, one of our uh, key areas of interest is in which of these um, isoforms are um, uh, specifically involved in cognitive disorders. And so we've um, done substantial work to, to um, validate that. And some key area questions that we've tried to address here at the Broad are, um, in addition to what key isoforms are involved in specific disease indications or um, roles in, in, in psychiatric disorders, is um, the uh, individual um, isoforms biological function in terms of acetylation and gene expression and the context in which um, they act, um, which are the key substrates for those individual isoforms. And um, this requires that we have a, um, a, a toolbox of highly selective inhibitors so that we can probe those questions individually. And, um, and then does selective inhibition of a given uh, HDAC isoform um, have a particular advantage in terms of on-target efficacy and, and, and safety uh, in terms of treating a particular disease state? Now, as I pointed out earlier, we like to base our um, therapeutic hypothesis based on um, what's um, already um, validated through human, human genetics. And uh, one particular um, uh, uh, piece of data that relates um, acetylation status and, and cognition is um, the uh, uh, rubenstein tybe syndrome, where um, a... Uh, a defect in, in a, a, a gene that encodes for a, a known um, histone acetylase transferase um, has a, um, a decrease in activity, and this leads to a decrease in, in histone acetylation uh, and uh, mental retardation. This uh, phenotype can be uh, recapitulated in, a, in a, um, a mouse model, and it does phenocopy the human disease, and, and that particular mouse model does exhibit learning and memory de uh, defects. And if you then um, treat that, that mouse with a, um, a known uh, HDAC inhibitor, in this case, Saha, which is a, a PAN inhibitor of HDAC, you actually can rescue that, that phenotype and, and restore acetylations as well as uh, improve uh, those, those cognitive defects that have been seen. There's also a growing body of evidence that's been published in the literature linking HDACs and, and their role in, in um, cognition and, and memory. Now, one uh, key um, study that uh, really helped to uh, directly link the role of HDAC2 and um, it, its role in, in um, memory and um, fear conditioning um, is, is the model in which we established this um, is uh, uh, data that was published from Lee Wise Sai's lab here at, at MIT. And um, what uh, her team did was um, produce a, an HDAC2 knockout mouse and um, uh, they uh, actually could establish a decrease in acetylation at two particular um, uh, acetylation site, uh, sites on, on H4, K12, and on um, H2B. Um, and there in the knockout case, you see um, a, uh, uh, an increase in acetylation at those, those, those particular sites. Now, um, using uh, an animal model that contains this knockout to um, actually uh, establish that, uh, that that 
uh, effect in, in, in the mouse model, they used a, um, a fear conditioning model where they um, uh, train a mouse in, in a, in a, a, under a set of conditions um, and then um, put it back in the home cage for a time and then return it to that environment and, um, and then um, measure the, the, the freezing response when they reintroduce that, um, that particular response. And uh, what they did find in the, in the knockout mouse was um, that in the um, uh, homozygous HDAC2 knockout mouse, you actually see a, 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 an increase in that memory um, and um, uh, an improvement in fear conditioning. Um, in the converse, when you overexpress HDAC2, you saw um, a, a decrease um, compared to the wild type. So, and that wasn't seen for a knockout or an overexpression of HDAC1. So, it seems to be a HDAC2 specific effect. So, this was um, foundational in establishing our, our um, efforts in, in this field, and um, the um, there was uh, already. Um, uh, uh, so a fair amount of information around known HDAC inhibitors and um, um, uh, certainly um, some known uh, inhibitors that were specific for HDAC 1, 2, um, and 1, 2, 3. And so there was a limited amount of structural information related to these, but um, where we focused our chemistry efforts was around this 14 angstrom pocket where um, introduction uh, Utilization of, of this structural element actually was responsible for generating these uh, selective HDAC1, too, and we wanted to further exploit that to now tease out a, a selectivity between 1 and 2. So this required um, the building of um, appropriate assays and tools that would allow us to um, precisely measure those, those differences in activity and um, uh, preferentially um, do that in, in, a, in a more physiological assay. This is a paper that was um, published uh, uh, from the, the Bradner and, and Masachek lab, and they had developed a, a novel um, substrate um, in it that um, is utilized in a trypsin-coupled assay, and they profiled a large panel of known HDAC inhibitors, and um, this became a, a nice reference set uh, for um, comparing the effects of um, our, our uh, medicinal chemistry compounds. But this uh, was a biochemical measurement, and um, we had um, the outstanding question of uh, would selective inhibitors uh, then translate to a difference in, in cellular response? Um, and um, we leveraged an internal effort here at the Broad where they were profiling um, a large panel of cancer cell lines, 1,000 genetically characterized cancer cell lines against a, um, a uh, uh, a hand-curated uh, probe kit which contained um, uh, 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 an array of different drugs and, and probe compounds that had been annotated for very specific and, and selective, potent and selective activity against a given target. And so contained within that probe kit was um, uh, a, a, an array of HDAC inhibitors, both um, PAN and 1-2 um, selective um, as well as other isoforms. And so in interrogating that data, what, uh, what we found was that um, for uh, different HDAC inhibitors, you saw different patterns of uh, sensitivity um, among selective HDAC inhibitors. So for example, Avernistat, which is a, a non-selective inhibitor, although we didn't see a, a broad range of uh, uh, sensitivities, and, and what we're looking at here is cell viability versus dose of the compound, and uh, sensitivity is correlated to area under the curve. And in using uh, an elastic uh, net, net regression analysis, we could actually um, correlate um, the sensitivities of these compounds to um, uh, genetic features in these cells. And um, an HDAC1-2 selective uh, inhibitor um, uh, produced a different um, uh, genetic correlation. But what was actually very interesting was in the case of this uh, HDAC Six selective inhibitor, um, it gave a, a very distinct pattern in that um, it was very, uh, very selective for um, a particular lineage, and that is um, uh, cancer lines derived um, from uh, stomach cancers. And so here, in this case, this HDAC6 inhibitor um, was uh, correlated uh, more with lineage rather than genetic feature. So in order to um, execute um, a, a given project in, in this space, it requires a, a uh, array of assay types. 
starting with um, having a high quality uh, source of, of recombinant proteins, um, appropriate synthetic libraries to, to screen against, and then um, assays in which you can profile the specificity. I gave you one example of that with the trypsin coupled um, uh, assay. Uh, but in addition to that, um, in this uh, particular area, we're interested in the acetylation state in, in primary neurons. And so um, a high content imaging assay was established to, to look at the um, specificity and, and uh, activity in cell-based assays. This is a schematic that, that um, represents the trypsin-coupled assay. Um, the substrate is represented here. And uh, there was two different substrates that were um, uh, established one for um, the 1, 2, 3, 6, 10, which is a, a methyl group at this R position uh, on, on the amide. And in the case of um, the substrate for HDAC 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9, uh, it was a, a trifluoromethyl group at this R position. Um, this assay, uh, we required the addition of, 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 of the HDAC and then um, uh, addition of trypsin to further cleave the product um, and generate the, the fluorophore, which was uh, then measured uh, in that assay. One, uh, in, in using this assay, um, we um, actually um, determined that um, for HDAC 1 and 2, what we were um, actually um, finding was that the trypsin uh, was creating artifacts in, in our assay in that it was cleaving um, the HDAC uh, 1 and 2 to a, a truncated form and thus, um, you know, in, introduced some, some doubts into the SAR that we were seeing. So we um, then decided that we needed to have an alternative um, assay format that um, would not uh, rely on, on uh, trips and cleavage. And um, that led us to um, the uh, uh, caliper microfluidics-based uh, uh, system, um, the Easy Reader, and uh, the, the chip-based system that um, uh, they had developed. And um, in this case, what you're you're um, measuring is 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 the conversion of the product to substrate. So as you um, remove that acetylation uh, mark on that, you you see a shift in in the um, uh, uh, of the substrate um, versus the, the product, so those can then be um, quantitated, um, and this can actually be run in a kinetic mode, which is another requirement for our assay. There was a substrate that had already been developed by, by Caliper for um, uh, the HDAC, but um, we were um, presented with a, an additional challenge in that the um, commercial substrates that they had available to them um, were, had very low activity for HDAC 1 and 2. And so on this uh, trace that you can see here at the bottom, they had a number of different substrates that utilized a, a histone 3-derived peptide, a histone 4, and then a P53 substrate. And all of these were tested, and they all gave um, less than about a 10% conversion over one hour at a very high enzyme concentration um, of uh, 200 nanomolar for HDAC 1 and 2. HDAC 3 was a little better, and then it was about 20 nanomolar. So we um, did some, uh, through a collaboration with, with, with Caliper, we actually developed a new substrate based on our knowledge of our, our um, trypsin-based um, substrates and um, applied those to developing our own in-house substrates, which um, gave a substantial improvement over the, um, the existing uh, HDAC substrate. And um, so in the traces on, on the top of this panel, what you can see is um, our substrate compared to the, um, the uh, H218 uh, commercial substrate. And um, looking at uh, product formation, um, you can see that um, at, at a much lower enzyme uh, concentration for HDAC1 and 2, 5 nanomolar, um, you can see um, substantial um, product formation and um, at HDAC3, even there, we could reduce the amount of, of enzyme compared to the, um, the existing substrate. So this was a, a helpful breakthrough. We did additional work to characterize um, these, these uh, new substrates um, for HDAC1, 2, and 3, and um, determined um, the, uh, the, the, the KCAT and KM. Uh, HDAC1 and 2 had very similar KMs for this new substrate, around 19 micromolar. 
and HDAC3 and, and core complex is around five micromolar. One of our goals was to actually be able to utilize these substrates to um, kinetically characterize different binding modes of different uh, inhibitor classes. And uh, this table um, shown here just represents the, um, the panel of HDAC1 through 9 and the substrate specificity that we determine based on these new, new substrates um, and the uh, HDAC um, concentration and substrate conversion rates that, that we obtained with these new substrates. So this was a substantial improvement over uh, existing substrates. The, um, these were also validated with um, uh, a, a panel of known, uh, known HDAC inhibitors, both PAN inhibitors, um, uh, the SAHA, and then also class one specific inhibitors such as uh, CI994 and Merck 60, which is uh, specificity for HDAC1 and 2. And, and uh, we got good correlation between this and the, um, uh, the, the trypsin coupled assay that we had been previously using. So out of our own internal efforts, um, we had uh, done, uh, we had screened a large um, library of our own in, uh, internal novel uh, compound collection, which is, is based on diversity-oriented synthesis. And uh, we had actually identified this, this novel class of um, uh, HDAC3 selective inhibitor, which um, was uh, quite specific uh, uh, at, at four micromolar versus um, the HDAC1 through 9, and um, uh, selective over um, 1 and 2. And um, this data was generated on, on the lab chip. Um, further characterization of that, and here we're showing um, the binding kinetic for um, HDAC3 with known inhibitors. And um, in the case of the um, CI994, we determined that it had a slow, a slow binding kinetics, as you can see here. SAHA, which is a, a fast on-off uh, inhibitor of, of uh, the HDAC um, with increasing concentrations, you, you see the, the, a linear rate, whereas in the case of, of the CI994, we saw this uh, decrease in, in, in rate. So our own uh, novel inhibitor, the uh, HDAC3 inhibitor, in that case, um, our um, kinetic, uh, we determined there that it was actually a mixed inhibitor, so unlike um, the I994 and Saha, which are um, competitive inhibitors, this, this was a mixed inhibitor that, that bound to both the substrate, the free enzyme, and, and the and, uh, enzyme substrate uh, complex with, with different affinities. So this is a, a novel binding mode, and um, uh, that compound is uh, uh, available as, as a, uh, a public probe. Um, other types of technologies that, that we utilize to, to, to characterize um, inhibitors and, and, and mechanism of action are um, biophysical-based methods and a, and a very high-throughput method that we utilize is um, uh, uh, the um, uh, thermoshift uh, assay um, technology, or, um, which is based on looking at protein stability in the presence of, of, of a dye, and as you ramp the temperature up, what you see is an unfolding of that protein and the binding of, of this, this hydrophobic um, dye to, to the protein. And so you can monitor that, um, that melting curve in, in, a, in a thermocycler um, in the presence of a, a small molecule that binds and stabilizes that protein, you see a shift in that curve. So that delta TM can then be used to um, uh, uh, measure um, binding, um, both for screening and for characterization of binding mode. And uh, on the right panel here, you see um, a dose-dependent binding of, of SAHA and stabilization of HDAC2. In the case of Merck 60, which is a, a tight binding uh, slow-off uh, inhibitor, we actually um, uh, show that, that, that uh, stabilization um, and uh, from that data, we actually determined the stoichiometry of, of HDAC2 and, and Merck 60 um, and see a one-to-one -one binding stoichiometry there. So uh, it's, it, it's great to have uh, precise biochemical data, but it's uh, also critical to know that your um, uh, probe molecule or, or, or uh, drug lead is, is, is active and in, in cells and engaging the target. 
And um, so we've um, developed a number of, of imaging-based assays to look at acetylation marks in, in neurons. And um, in this case, we're specifically monitoring um, the uh, acetylated H4K12 um, site. And in the presence of a, um, an HDAC inhibitor, um, you can see an increase in acetylation of that site uh, in the neuron. So this is a, a sensitive um, way to, to, to monitor that, that activity. So moving on to other, other types of, uh, of targets and uh, areas of interest for, for us um, and uh, that have uh, strong links to, to human genetics, um, another area um, of uh, important targets is in the case of um, uh, the um, uh, chromatin uh, remodeling complexes, in, in this case, bromo domains, which are actually the readers of acetylation marks. And um, these um, are actually um, a, a, a very attractive target in that they contain a, a deep uh, hydrophobic um, uh, acetylene, uh, acetylacine binding pocket. And um, there are now a number of, um, of excellent inhibitors out there, um, one example being JQ1. Uh, which targets uh, BRD2 um, and 4, uh, and that um, uh, probe came from, from the Bradner lab. So we've um, undertaken a number of projects in this space, and one in particular was in collaboration with Jerry Crabtree's lab at, at Stanford and Stefan Knapp at uh, Oxford, who is part of the uh, Structural Genomics Consortium. And the goal of this project was to find small molecules that actually um, modulated the activity of uh, ESBAF, which is um, essential for pluripotency and, and, and renewal. So this is a, uh, a remodeling complex in embryonic stem cells, and the uh, bromo domain contained within this complex is, is, is BERG1. And um, we took a two-pronged strategy here to identify uh, inhibitors of BERG1. One was using a gene expression assay to, uh, and measuring the endogenous uh, bi uh, biology in ES cells, and another was to take a biophysical approach to find small molecule binders to, to BRG1. So the um, cell-based uh, strategy um, was to target this ATP-dependent um, complex, this, a switch sniff complex, and um, we, it had been shown that knockdown of BRG1 uh, in these cells actually um, uh, had an effect on the regulation of BMI1 um, uh, gene, and uh, you could see a, a dose-dependent knockdown and in, 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 in increase in BMI1 levels. So that became the biomarker that was followed in, in a, a 30,000 compound screen using qPCR as the readout. And uh, this data is actually published in, in the Journal of Biomolecular Screening, um, and a number of uh, tool compounds were identified in that screen. Um, our uh, second strategy was to take um, the uh, BRG1 domain itself and in a biochemical screen, um, screen for small molecules that would stabilize, stabilize that complex. And um, from that screen, we found a number of um, small molecule uh, probe tools that, that um, were interacting directly with BRG1. In the case of a much larger field and, and very active area of drug discovery is in the area of histone lysine methylation, both the um, methyl transferases and uh, the, the demethylases. And um, these are involved in a number of different uh, regulatory mechanisms in, 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 in controlling gene expression and, and, and silencing. And in particular, um, there's, again, uh, an excellent resource of information and knowledge about uh, a growing body of, of very selective tool compounds that can be used to probe those, those particular um, uh, targets in, 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 in both um, biochemical and cell-based models. This um, is the Epizyme um, poster that I think is, is, is widely used now and uh, has become sort of a, a, a key reference for this field. The uh, particular targets that we're interested in here at the Broad um, uh, have uh, uh, mainly a role in, in cancer, so EZH2 um, and the uh, PRC2 uh, um, function in, in uh, ovarian cancer and, and glioblastoma. And this particular enzyme is, is, is involved in, in catalyzing um, uh, dimethyl and trimethyl um, and it's uh, associated with transcriptional regulation. 
Um, another group of enzymes um, important, in, in, especially in blood cancers, um, uh, NSD1, 2, and 3. And uh, again, these are adding um, uh, mono, tri uh, di, and trimethyl marks um, to that transcription complex. Dot 1L, uh, an important target, and uh, now some uh, you know very exciting data coming out of Epizyme around that. And, and uh, one of the big challenges with with this particular target class is, although um, there are certainly uh, assays available, um, in terms of physiological relevance of, of those assays, I think that's a key challenge. And um, on this summary slide here, I'm just um, listing some of the, um, the the challenges that I think the face the field still faces. Um, one, in terms of the, the supply of active enzymes, these enzymes tend to have very low turnover, not very catalytically active, so um, actually getting robust sources of enzymes. Um, I mentioned physiologically relevant substrates. Um, many of the assays rely on uh, peptide substrates, um, but um, the ability to use um, nucleosomes or, or um, histone octamers um, is much more relevant, but the again, the the activity of these enzymes against those substrates is very low. So the field has become very reliant on radioactive methods for these types of assays um, and uh, really a need to be able to um, uh, translate, uh, translate those radioactive assays to fluorescent and, and luminescent-based methods would really um, enhance the field. Um, I think there's a, a nice growing uh, list of, of probes and the availability of those probe molecules through um, the likes of the SGC and, and um, our own uh, public efforts. Um, and, but I think a, a huge area of need is, is in terms of um, uh, sensitive and selective cell-based assays. I think when there's a good antibody available that can actually monitor um, a particular uh, uh, methylation uh, mark, um, that's, that's very limited in terms of getting selectivity. So I think these are some of the areas that hopefully the, um, uh, both the uh, uh, researchers working in this field as well as the, the, the vendor community is, is, is looking to address. I think this is uh, something that's needed and would enhance the field. So at that point, I'm going to um, stop, and I'd uh, like to uh, finish by thanking my uh, colleagues in, in the therapeutics platform here at, at the Broad Institute. Uh, it's a, a large group of individuals um, with uh, a diverse uh, background and expertise. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Michelle. Before we move on to Jan and Tiger's presentation, I want to remind you once again about submitting questions through the Ask a Question box. All right, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, today we will talk about applying chemical biology strategy in epigenetics research and the drug discovery in GSK, a case study of cellular regulation of histone 3 K27 trimethylation. Epigenetics is a major field of biomedical research and epigenetic drug discovery shows great promise for many unconquered diseases, including cancers, autoimmune diseases. Several epigenetic inhibitors are already approved for human treatment. There are two main components of the epigenetic code, DNA methylation and histone modification. For histone modification, amino acid residues of the histone, especially those located at their N-terminal tails, are subjected to different types of post-translational modifications, including acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, and uh, ubiquitination. Focus of our study here today is histone modification, uh, particularly the histone methylation. One epigenetic regulation example shown here on the slide is trimethylation of histone 3 K27, uh, which is a crucial process for the proper programming of the genome during the cell development. From recent studies, uh, we all have known that trimethylation of H3K27 is associated with particular cellular processes, uh, those including mitosis and the regulation of transcription. It has been suggested to be linked to the pro-oncogenic effects. Uh, indeed, H3K27 trimethylation itself is a chromatin marker in several tumor types. 
it has also been known that the H3K27 trimethylation is linked to self-renew and the differentiation of stem cells. In drug discovery research, uh, we all know that the current drug discovery strategy, which includes both molecular and phenotypic approaches. The molecular approach are predominantly hypothesis-driven and therefore are referred as target-based. The other one is the empirical approach, which usually is referred as phenotypic because they rely on the phenotypic measurement of response. These two different strategies also apply to the epigenetic drug, drug discovery. First, the targeting the epigenetic readers, writers, and erasers, those would be qualified as a target-based approach. And in phenotypic-based approach, the study or the research could target any signaling factors and the pathways as long as we get those epigenetic modification outcomes we want to be. Uh, for our interest here, the H3 lysine 27 trimethylation, as I mentioned previously, when we look at uh, the regulation of that, uh, this uh, trimethylation indeed is balanced by the activity of the histone methyl transferase and the demethylases. Not surprising that many companies and institutions are pursuing methyl transferases and the demethylases as targets for the drug discovery. Although these methyl transferases and the demethylases represent logical targets for potential drug discovery, it's also important to be aware that, like all other cellular signaling regulations, epigenetic regulation is not an isolated event. Many factors beyond the methyl transferases and the demethylases could have profound effects on the regulation of the histone methylation. So what's beyond those methyl transferases and the demethylases and how we can figure that out? Uh, from here, now our goal became clear. We want to study how signaling factors and the pathways can affect the epigenetic modifications in the cell. In this study I'm going to describe here, we use a unique chemical probe system built in GSK. We call it a biologically diverse compound set, BDCS. And we also use OPERA, a high throughput imaging analysis platform. With these two elements, we studied the regulation of the H3K27 trimethylation. In our study here, indeed, we take a hybrid approach, combining both the phenotypic and the target-based drug discovery strategies. So high content image is the phenotypic element, and the chemical probe system is a target-based tool, which I will explain more details in following slides. So what is BDCS? How was BDCS made? This is a unique chemical biology tool built to manipulate and study the cellular signaling transduction and the pathway regulation in phenotypic screening setting. For BDCS, about 6,000 compounds, uh, they target 736 unique protein targets, which were selected from their diverse and fundamental biological activities. And for each target, up to 10 maximally selective two compounds were picked. So the on-target effects can be easily identified after our phenotypic screening if multiple two compounds against the same target are found to have activity or show the activity in our screening. As shown here uh, on the slides, six, about 6,000 compounds, uh, 736 targets, uh, cover the, uh, the target classes from GPCR to kinase, enzymes, protease, ion channels, uh, nuclear hormone receptors, uh, transporters, integrins, as well as uh, ligases and uh, growth factors. 
Here is a design of our H3 K27 trimethylation phenotypical screen system. As we all know, uh, histone methyl transferase and uh, demethylases, examples like uh, EZH2 uh, as a uh, methyl transferase and uh, UTX as demethylases, they play essential roles in the epigenetic maintenance. And uh, histone 3 K27 trimethylation is a chromatin marker in several tumor types. So we developed a high content imaging assay system here to quantify the histone 3 K27 trimethylation levels in HCC 1806 cells. This cell model is a cellular system established from the squamous carcinoma of the breast with the demethylase gene UTX inactivated. In this system, uh, we measure the induction or reduction of the histone 3 K27 trimethylation level uh, by a method using immunocytochemically. Uh, in our study, we explored the regulation of the H3K27 trimethylation in response to different biological stimuli uh, which are induced uh, by the 6,000 high, highly targeted selective and also very well annotated BDCS chemical probes. Next, I would uh, let my colleague Tiger B uh, describe how he developed this assay. And the Tiger is also the person who helped the screening process of BDCS library using this uh, phenotypic assay model system. All right, thank you, Ian. So this is a six-day assay. So basically, we use uh, the frozen HCC-1806 breast cancer cell line. So after play the cell into 384 well place, we let the cell recover overnight in incubator. And next day we add the compound and incubate for three days, followed by immunostaining protocol to stain cells. And eventually we measure the translation on 1927 of histone 3 in nuclei on a single cell basis. All right, so like a typical high content image assay. This assay generated many readouts, including cell count, cell size, fluorescent intensity, and so on. And two major readouts are cell count and fluorescent intensity of trimethylation staining. So after three day treatment with compound, uh, in this case we call it compound A, trimethylation level drastic decrease. Okay, so in the dark picture, the lower right in the middle, so you can see clearly the contrast between the DMSO control, which is uh, the top right, those cells, the nuclei showing the green fluorescent and the dark one. Okay, so the uh, the road, uh, the response is very robust. So that make it ideal for single uh, single shot screening. So we apply it to screen. 58,000 biologically diverse compound set, as well as all the follow-up 11 dose compound profiling. So for each compound, we plot two parameters. Okay, so showing uh, in the graph below, cell count and trimethylation. And the data were normalized by negative control DMSO and positive control compound to scale zero and 100. Okay, so let's spend a few minutes on segmentation of reason. So a typical image assay start with the nuclei. Okay, so showing the second path in the middle. So by uh, basically identify the nuclei and cell border and calculate all the properties, including intensity, morphology, um, and uh, texture within cells or subcellular compartment. And in this, in, in this assay, we actually have the alternative, especially when we need higher throughput. Okay, so um, because uh, uh, the histone methylation happened in nuclei, and we're only in interested in nuclei and trimethylation staining and nothing else. So we create a mask, basically cover entire nuclear area and report the average fluorescent intensity of the trimethylation staining, along with the total cell area. And actually both approach generate very 
high quality statistics, uh, uh, statistics. Okay, show in the table, a gray signal background window, and Z prime. And this slide shows a, a, a scatter plot of a multiplex outcome from the screen. So basically, x-axis is a percent change in cell count, and y-axis is translation level. For both axes, DMSO traded wells were used to normalize and set a 0% change. So the mean plus or minus three times standard deviation value were used as a cutoff to define heat and divide the compound population into nine different categories. So uh, we can roughly see the data point like scattered across the board. And the area A on the upper central block include those compounds that cause significant increase in trimethylation on histone 3 lysine 27 without too much change in cell count. And area B uh, on the bottom center block includes those compounds that cause statistically significant decrease in trimethylation but with minor change in cell count. And a few EZH2 species compounds identified in this area. Okay, so now I pass it to Yen. Thanks, Tiger. Uh, here is a critical pass map of our follow-up work. So start from the top of the slide. Uh, we screened the BDCS in histone 3 k 27 trimethylation assay, and uh, we identify and confirmed those hits. Next step, we move on to test those hits in uh, mass transferase or demethylases by chemical or enzymatic assays. If these hits from our phenotypic screen shows uh, direct mass transferase or demethylases activity, these hits actually would be quite interesting, uh, potentially provide new chemical series uh, for mass transferase and demethylases targets. And if these hits uh, do not show any direct uh, enzymatic activity against the mass transferase and the demethylases, these hits still are important. It could help us understand the biological network of the cellular pathways and uh, potentially identify novel targets. An example show on the screen right now. Uh, uh, during our study, we found the sorafenib as a novel histone 3K27 trimethylation suppressor uh, from our study. Sorafenib uh, itself is a small molecular inhibitor of several tyrosine kinases, uh, including VGFR receptor, PDGF receptor, as well as uh, RAF kinases. As you can see in the full curve study here, the sorafenib is quite potent to suppress the histone 3K27 trimethylation level uh, in our phenotypic assay. With a good separation from the uh, potential toxic effects. The blue line stand for the trimethylation standing outcome, and the red lines here, red dots represent the toxicity readout. And after uh, confirming the, the four curve finding in the phenotypic assays, uh, we moved on to test the sorafenib in biochemical assays. This compound uh, was further tested in various formats of the EZH2 peptide and the nucleosome biochemical activity assay, and it has no direct effects against EZH2 at all. Finally, we evaluated the interaction and the functional importance of the signaling pathways uh, which modulate the histone 3 K27 trimethylation level in HCC1806 cell model system. So based on the BDCS target compound annotation information, we performed the binned analysis of the histone 3 K27 trimethylation phenotypic hits. Uh, we have a total about 495 compounds identified in our screen, and those compounds, 495 compounds, target against uh, 334 targets. We further separated them into suppressors and enhancers, two categories. 
these compounds then further bind based on how many hits number per target, uh, as you can see in the analysis of the two lower panels. To move on for the informatic analysis, uh, to reduce the false positive hits, only targets with two or more compound hits found in our study were selected for the pathway analysis. That reduced to a total of the 107 targets we uh, performed the ingenuity pathway analysis. So here is the outcome of the ingenuity pathway analysis. Uh, what we are looking here is uh, we want to use the annotation of the target found in our screen, try to evaluate the interaction and the functional importance of the signaling pathway, uh, which can modulate the histone 3 K27 trimethylation levels in, in our study. Using p-value less than 0.01 as a statistical cutoff here, uh, there are uh, top five canonical pathways identified in our uh, study. Uh, from the top in our uh, table here, the ER2, ERB2, ERB3 signaling uh, followed with uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma signalings, and we also identified serotonin receptor signalings, ceramide signalings, and uh, interleukin-4 uh, signalings. And uh, on the right side, uh, in the right column of the uh, table, you will see those targets identified in our study and how they are mapped to those top five uh, canonical pathways. So summary for our work here, uh, we built a BDCS in GSK, and this is a unique design of multiple highly selective compounds against uh, a larger class of the um, targets. And these information are all based on years of the inst institutional knowledge in GSK. I hope the study we presented here have shown you that using highly selective and well annotated chemical probe library uh, in phenotypic screening setting has its uh, unique advantage. In drug discovery setting, the siRNA screen is another popular approach for target identification. Although I have to say our BDCS library covers fewer targets than a conventional, uh, a conventional druggable target siRNA library. Uh, those targets, if identified in our screening, uh, would have already been proven to be trackable and readily associated with the highly selective compounds, uh, the advantage which the siRNA library uh, cannot provide. Also, with multiple distinct chemical classes selected from most targets in our BDCS library, the newly identified targets after they are validated, um, what we have those chemical probes here could offer very good starting points for the drug discovery programs. And uh, in some scenarios could even include the potential uh, drug reposition or repurposing opportunities. From the histone 3 K27 trimethylation phenotypic screening using our BDCS library, uh, we, we found a number of the targets, including the EZH2, uh, were in, in our screening, and the multiple hits against each target were identified. Those really add our confidence uh, uh, these targets are relevant uh, and not off-target uh, finding in our study. Among those targets, several non non-methyl transferase and uh, non demethylase targets could be potential upstream regulators of the histone 3 K27 trimethylation. Finally, using IPA, uh, we identified several interesting canonical pathways here. They are likely to be involved in histone 3 K27 trimethylation regulation in our model system. Among those, the breast cancer ERB2 signaling and the pancreatic acinocarcinoma signaling have already been reported in the literature to be associated with EZH2 and its epigenetic regulation. Potential 
targets uh, mapped in those two pathways as well as other pathways I listed before uh, could be a novel upstream regulator of the EZH2 histone 3 k 27 trimethylation uh, regulation axis. Future follow-up study could help us understand the global regulation of histone 3 k 27 trimethylation uh, beyond just those message transferases and demethylases target. And ultimately, this information could benefit our epigenetic drug discovery research. I would like to say a uh, similar research or similar strategy could also be applied to other types of the histone modifications, including acetylation, ubiquitination in, in epigenetic research. Finally, I would like to say this is a study collaborated among multiple departments in GSK, Molecular Discovery Research, Regenerative Medicine DPU, as well as a Computational Biology Group. Also, a bright summer student, Baju, contributed to this work as well. I would like to say, thank, uh, say thanks to all my colleagues listed here and also thank uh, Jim Webinar for inviting us to presenting this work. And this work is just being published in the Molecular Biosystems Journal. And uh, thank you, our audience, for listening to this. Thank you. And thank you, Jan, for your presentation. We already have some questions for you and Tiger, but before we start those questions, I just want to remind everyone that we still have time for you to submit questions for Michelle, Jan, or Tiger. We'll answer as many questions as we can. I also want to let you know that very shortly a post-webinar survey will deploy in the presentation manager. Please take a few minutes and respond. Your comments are extremely valuable to us. In order to see the survey, you might need to disable some pop-up blockers. All right, uh, let's get started on our Q&A discussion. We have a lot of good questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Our first question is for Michelle. Michelle, according to your research observations, would modulating reader binding affinity and selectivity to specific histone marks be a valid approach to correct aberrant acetylation methylation processes? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tammy. Um, yes, I think that's a, a very relevant um, approach, and uh, there's certainly examples in our own research looking at HDAC inhibitors where um, you can uh, follow um, changes in a specific acetylation marks both in cell models and then um, uh, in this particular case in neurons and then moving on to um, uh, animal models and, and looking in the um, the brain of, of the, uh, the, the the mouse model. So it, it's it, it's translatable at that level. Um, our compounds have not made it into humans yet, so can't speak to that. All right, Michelle, I have another question for you. Why are the dose curves for varinitat, Merck, 1 and 2 specific compounds not completely sigmoidal? Uh, I think that question is referring to the data I showed from our um, cancer cell line profiling. Uh, experiment that was a, a thousand cancer cell lines from um, uh, various uh, tumor types uh, that are um, uh, completely uh, gene they're genetically characterized for mutational status, um, copy number variations, um, et cetera. And uh, the curves that you're referring to, those are generated um, a range of um, Merck. Uh, 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 Merck 60 compound, um, uh, Vernistat, actually um, in a full dose. And, and so depending on the range in which those cells are sensitive to that, you're, you're going to see a, a, a full dose response curves or um, uh, just a, a, a portion of that dose response curve. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Jan, I have some questions for you now. Um, do you have any plan to use cell co-culture, 3D cell culture, microtissue analyses to further investigate the regulation of H3K27 trimethylation? Uh, yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, 3D cell culture and uh, micro tissue, and uh, sometimes people refer as uh, uh, organ on a chip, uh, those type of analysis are uh, definitely our next steps. And uh, the direction of our research in GSK and I, I believe everywhere else as well is going toward the human disease relevant research. And utilizing these uh, uh, more relevant models 
uh, would be very important for us to for the uh, target validation study uh, evaluation of the compound efficacy uh, might also uh, provide some new opportunity finding uh, new disease indications in the uh, epigenetic research. All right, thanks, Jan. Here's another question: Is BDCS library commercially available? Uh, yeah, for, for the BDCS uh, library, uh, this is an uh, internal GSK asset. Uh, I would say it's not commercially available, uh, but it could be, I would say it could be available for research uh, uh, if the collaboration with the GSK uh, uh, can be established. All right, thanks, Jan. Uh, Tiger, we have some questions for you right now. Uh, did you observe any additional phenotypic changes with increasing H3K27 trimethylation levels? And actually, this is a two-part question. What's the difference between high-content screening, opera, and other microscope, confocal, fluorescence, et cetera? Okay, sure. Thank you for the question. Okay, so for the first part, we did observe some phenotypic change in other cell line. So I would say it's more like cell line dependent, for example, uh, in the PC3 uh, prostate cancer cells, we did see the cells, uh, the increase of cell size corresponding to decrease in trimethylation level. And for the second part, I think the major difference between high content screening instrument and standalone microscope is the throughput. Okay, so high content screening instrument has the ability to read um, probably a couple dozen multi well plates per day. Uh, while well, staying alone scope cannot do it that effectively. All right, actually, I do have another question for Jan. Um, was UTX mutation required to observe the loss of H3K27ME3 in the HCS screen? Uh, well, the high content screening or, or, or the study of the H3K27 trimethylation uh, can be studied in multiple different cellular models. And uh, the current model we presented here is HCC1806 uh, does have a UTX mutation and uh, the uh, trimethylation level therefore is increased uh, at, the, uh, at the basal level in that uh, cellular model. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the reasons actually we choose the, to, to study the assay development could be uh, we can turn it into a more robust assay system. But the other systems like uh, uh, PC3 cell model system, which tend to have a UTX mutation, uh, we were able to actually do very similar approach on that. Thank you, Jan. Unfortunately, our time is up right now. Thanks for listening in, and thanks for the great questions. There were several questions that we didn't have time to answer, and we will get to those. We can email back the people who asked them. Thanks for submitting them, and I'm sorry we couldn't answer them today. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Uh, once again, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for your time today, as well as our sponsor, Perkin Elmer. Thank you.